Oh, oh, Mike, do you yeah. know what a pluripotent mesenchymal stem cell is? Yeah, of course I do. You don't, do you? Come on, let's get Russell Chandler in. He'll tell us. OK. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Oh, hello. Hello, Russell. How are you? Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm fantastic, thank you. How are you? We're excellent, thank you. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming on. <laughs> We're going to get right into it with the important question. Imposter syndrome. Because you mentioned this in your little letter to us, your email to us. Yes, yes. It's something we've come across with every vet we've spoken to. Yeah. (laughs) Imposter syndrome, it's a very, very trendy thing now, isn't it? You've got to have imposter syndrome. If you're a vet, you've got to have imposter syndrome. Mm. Um, I'm not a big sufferer from imposter syndrome. What I... Well, in common with probably most vets is I like to know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to talk, I want to know, you know, that what I'm saying has some veracity. Mm-hmm. And the problem with science and the problem with veterinary medicine and surgery is it's just too wide. How can you mm-hmm. possibly get a foothold on a subject that's expanding exponentially as we speak? Mm-hmm. Every time you turn around, there's something new. So we're all, we're all sort of prone to imposter syndrome for that reason. Mm -hmm. It's because we're trying to cling to an avalanche of information and try to make sense of it when most of us, well, myself, I would include in this, are clinicians. So we're quite good at solving problems and fixing things, but I'm not a great scientist. I don't have a deep, deep scientific understanding. Um, I'm, I'm more of a, you know, a fix it kind of guy. Mm-hmm. North surgeon. We're not famous for our deep analysis of problems. Okay, <laughs> we're, more, we're more hands-on. We're practical. Yeah. I'm a practical sort of person. Okay, so I see the headline, but I'm not wonderful at delving deep down into the substance. So I have to force myself. So from the point of view of the imposter syndrome, um, I, it's, a, it's an effort that I have to make to delve deeper into my subjects. Um, But I do feel vulnerable and I do feel as though, wait a minute, do I really know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the audience knows more than me. I'm sure Mm -hmm. I'm going to look a bit silly if I say this or that or or get it wrong. Um, But as I've got older, I found that it really doesn't matter. If you make a mistake, you hold your hand up and you say, I've made a mistake. I don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. Uh, but I'm doing my best. I'm trying, you know. I'm you know that, that, that's that's very, very, very eloquently put. And oh. I think we all, as you say, we were all uh, subject to imposter syndrome. And I remember doing a lecture once, thinking, I, "I feel sure that I'm underqualified for this. Someone's going to stand up, point a finger at me, and say, no, that's wrong.' And in fact, someone did. They stood up and said, "No, no, no, you, you got that wrong." And I said, "I'm, I'm terribly sorry, have I?" And so. They, they said why well, I got it wrong, and I suddenly thought, actually, no, no, I, I know this, I do know this. So I said, no, I, I don't think I have, I, th- I think you're working on such and such a paper, which in fact was disproved. So I'm going to stick to what I said. <laughs> and I said, oh, hmm, okay, thanks. And suddenly thought, oh, wow, yeah. I knew that. I didn't know anything else about it, but I, I knew that one little bit that he picked me up on quite yeah, quickly. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Sometimes standing up to criticism, you know, is the way to do it. If you back down too easily, then that puts you in a weak position, doesn't it? But, you know, to some degree you've got to argue, argue your corner. Standing up to criticism is, is, is formulating an argument and, and discussing. And that's, that's how we learn, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the scientific method is based on having a theory and then seeing how robust it is and yeah. trying every which way to destroy it. Mm-hmm. So if I have an idea, you know, what I try to do is um, I, I'm not too sort of attached to that idea, but I will test it or put it out there and let other people test it. And you'll find out how, how wrong you are because other people will tell you. Yes. And, and that's the great thing about 
science or a bit having you know being in a scientific discipline is that it has got that those checks and balances you know to take yes. apart the theory and destroy it and if the theory can't be destroyed then it survives for a little bit longer but but russell you you take it one step further though don't you because you you feel that you don't quite know enough about a subject so you go off and do another degree yeah i mean i do have a slight addiction to learning so you know people ask me what do i do in my spare time um what hobbies do i have you know what pursuits um once hang I've on, hang on. we ask the questions yeah, we <laughs> so tell me, Russell. It's what, okay. yeah. we'll these, what hobbies we'll do you have? We'll let Mike. We'll let Russell talk. <laughs> I'm used to Ask being in the other chair, aren't I? I'm, I'm used to being the one asking the questions. So yeah, I mean, be, from the point of view of um, further study and further sort of um, scientific endeavours, um, I am somewhat addicted to learning more. I just mm -hmm. want to know the answers. I like. The puzzle of it. Um, in my current master's degree that I'm doing, um, it's wonderful because all of the stuff is completely new to me. Right. There's not, mm -hmm. there's not anything that I'm learning that I could say, oh, I remember that from university. Because back in the day when I was in university, this stuff that I'm learning didn't exist. Right. So yeah. it's all new. That it's all new science that's happened within the last twenty years. So. Um, it's all completely new to me, and it's kind of like having to learn the whole language of science all over again. Because what I thought I knew, obviously, is so far out of date, it's not even funny. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we, we'll, we'll get into the, the MSc you're doing at, at the moment uh, oh. in, in a little while. Um, but the MSc you did prior to that was orthopedic mm -hmm. engineering. Exactly. Was it it so, was. And so what, what's that all about? Just making making a long plate, drilling holes in it and using it to fix the femur? Well, no, it's all about so, like cantilevers and angles and forces. It's, oh, it's, 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 it's all of that and more. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> so the reason I did it was because I felt as though I needed to do some further study. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I, was, uh, I had a young family at the time, um, so I couldn't really go and do a residency or go and do anything, you know, in a university. So I was looking for courses that were part-time and, you know, the teaching was on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I found one very, very close to where I live. I live in Newport and this was in Cardiff. So it's mm -hmm. 15 miles from my house. And all the lectures were on a Saturday and Sunday. So it was perfect. Okay. The other thing about it was there were no vets on the course at all. It's a course that was for human orthopedic surgeons mm -hmm. so as part of their development um some lucky human orthopedic surgeons get to study engineering as well so the engineering um knowledge and expertise really puts them in a very different category of surgeon because they're not just a surgeon but they're a surgeon who knows a little bit about engineering which mm. is of great help so basically what it did for me was it made me look at things in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. So rather than thinking about all the things that we think about as vets, you know, the analgesia, the anesthesia, the aseptic technique, you know, the patient, the client, the nursing team, all of those things that we think about, you're thinking about the engineering side. You're thinking basically about the physics and you're looking at the, the construct that you're building maybe it's a fracture you're looking mm -hmm. at it like somebody might be looking at when they're building a bridge you're mm -hmm. looking for the weak points you're looking and saying well how is this going to fail if this is going to fail and things always fail mm -hmm. where is it going to fail and what can we do to mitigate that and how can we overcome that because something like a fracture you know to get a fracture to heal it's a race against time mm -hmm. the construct that you put in there maybe it's a plate and screws that will always fail but if you can get the bone to heal before it fails, then you're home and dry. Mm -hmm. So it's that, it's that you know, juxtaposition of, of, of those two processes, really. So um, 
I found it fantastic because I was rubbing shoulders with um, human orthopedic surgeons mm-hmm. who've got a completely different way of looking at things. And, and they're, they're not like vets at all. In, in, in a way, they, they are and they aren't. Um, so I made a lot of contacts. I made a lot of friends. And I was able to learn quite a lot of human anatomy, physiology, and orthopedics, which is translatable into the veterinary field. So all in all, I found that it made me um, a very different kind of veterinary orthopedic surgeon. Mm-hmm. 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 What, yeah. what did they make of you as a vet? Great question. I think I was a bit of a novelty, really, a bit of a curiosity, a strange specimen, if you like. Um, I think uh, initially they didn't think that I would have any kind of um, common ground with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't imagine that we did orthopedic surgery on animals. Mm -hmm. No, I I think the the surgeons I know, orthopedics and issues are always very surprised and, and the medics are always very surprised oh, yes. that we do things to, to a similar sort of level yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah so 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 the the sort of things that they would say was yeah well yes but you wouldn't you wouldn't put a bone plate in would you well yes actually we do oh mm-hmm. but you haven't got an operating theater like we've got well yes actually we have okay <laughs> but you wouldn't do it aseptically and you haven't got sterile you know, a sterile setup and say, actually, yes, we have all of those things. But then you find that the more that they criticize you and, and, and discuss it with you, then you find that you've got a lot of skills and knowledge that they don't have. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about being a surgeon in the human field is that it's very narrow. Mm-hmm. So yes. they might be very, very knowledgeable and practiced about doing the little bit that they do or the big mm-hmm. bit that they do, but whatever it is that they do, maybe it's hip replacements or whatever, mm-hmm. but they don't know anything about analgesia. Mm-hmm. And they know very little about anesthesia mm-hmm. and yes. diagnostic imaging. Okay. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that astonished them was that we take our own radiographs. They couldn't believe that we were actually allowed to take our own radiographs <coughs> and actually allowed to press the button because they've always been told when they're doing their practices, no, nope, you need a radiographer. That's the person who presses the button, and it's not you. Yes. So, yeah. So, yeah. so it made me appreciate really even more, be me even more appreciative of being a vet is that you can get involved in all these other things. If I want to do an X-ray, I can do an X-ray. If I want to do a, a laboratory test, I can take the blood. I can run the test if I want to. I can do all of those things. Yeah. If I want to anesthetize a patient, okay. As long as I've got the skills and knowledge, I can anesthetize that patient. If I want to do an epidural, I'll do that. You know, so it's great that you can do all of those things. You don't have to, but you have the knowledge yeah. and you have the skill to do that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you could you could describe us, I guess, as um, as pluripotent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great phrase. Where have you got that from? <laughs> Or at, least multi, or at least multi-potent. Are you, are you, are you going to explain that joke? Because I'm sure you've just gone past lots of our listeners. And just because we've been talking about it before Russell came on. Um, <laughs> so so plur- pluripotent uh, literally means from, from the um, Latin, um, uh, able to do many things, pluri, many uh, potent power or, or capabilities. Um, but actually, in, in biological terms, uh, pluripotent is really limited to a certain type of cell, uh, something called a stem cell that um, is able to divide into many other different types of, uh, of cell. And the, the reason I, I mentioned that was because your, I think the, the majority of your work, I may be wrong, the majority of your work at the moment is, is, is in application of stem cell therapy to pets so so how do you get into that right okay so yeah so uh, the stem cells so part of what i like doing is making animals better okay Mm -hmm. and surgery is great for that you get kind of almost an instant result with surgery you know if it's good you know if it's bad you know if it's gone wrong and it's very very rewarding 
but surgery is That's quite the in the dermatology, isn't it? Russell? Well, exactly. Yeah. Well, or, oncology, or maybe cardiology. Yeah. Excluding you do get that emer emergency yeah. dermatology. Yes. Well, that's, that's that's just soluble steroids. Yeah, but emergency dermatology is <laughs> yeah, that we're not going to touch on that. Yeah. We're talking orthopedic. We're not, we're not yeah. Talking carpentry. Yeah. But exactly. So with your carpentry, you get quite rapid feedback. Yeah. If it's going to fall apart, it normally falls apart within a day or a week. Okay. Mm. So you know that you've done a lousy job. And most of the time you don't get that. Most of the time it does work. And it is very, very rewarding as a speciality. What I'm interested in is those cases where either surgery is not applicable mm -hmm. or surgery can be enhanced using some cell therapy or something like a chronic disease like osteoarthritis where surgery may not be feasible, may not be possible, may not be affordable. And you're looking for something else biological to get involved in mm -hmm. so my journey started really with um using platelet rich plasma and when platelet rich plasma came along in a in a form that was um easily applicable to practice so using a filter so it meant that we could take blood from the patient itself yep. extract the platelets concentrate them in an injection and inject those back into say a joint or a tissue where we wanted um, to have some trophic effects, some repairing, um, and it worked pretty well. So, just to, just to do a quick aside here, because again, yeah. we've got people listening who, who may not know what a platelet is, and so platelets are the, the the tiny little fragmented red blood cell derivatives, if you like, that help with clotting process. So, why why would they be any good for for healing? True. Yeah. So if you look in a textbook, the platelets are referred to as a fragment of, of mm. a cell. Mm -hmm. I think that's doing them a great disservice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they come from the bone marrow from a great big precursor cell called a megakaryocyte, which is a great big multinucleate cell. And they are made there and then released into the circulation. Um, and they've got granules in them um, of various kinds. And inside these granules, uh, they're packed with growth factors. So in the old days, oh, certainly when I was at veterinary school, we were taught that platelets are for blood clotting. Yeah. A nice little story. Okay. And that was the end of the chat, really. That was all she wrote. Yeah. But that's now it. we realise, yeah, now we realise that a platelet, yes, it's involved in blood clotting. So it's part of the emergency response, if you like, but it's very much like a first responder. So it's not only um, a cell, I'll call it a cell, even though it doesn't have a nucleus. It's not only a cell that is involved in blood clotting, but it's also involved in the response to injury and to coordinating the healing. So it recruits other cells. Uh, it's full of um, factors which um, aid the healing process. So it's a great sort of natural thing to harness. So if you want to get into regenerative medicine and you want a stepping off point and platelet rich plasma is a really good place to start. It's easy to do. Okay. All you need is to take blood from your patient and it's autologous, which means it goes from your patient after processing back into the same patient. So there's no rejection. There's no immune reaction against it. So that's where I started. Um, and once I'd started doing that, then um, stem cells came along and uh, it's possible to do autologous stem cells. So what this means is um, you can take either bone marrow or fat tissue. And in my case, I take fat tissue from um, it's mainly dogs. So you've got a great big um, reserve of fat normally at some point in the dog, maybe in the inguinal area. And you can take some of this autologous fat tissue and if you aseptically harvest that, you can send that to the lab, okay, a special lab that's got a license to do this, and they are able to very cleverly take out the stem cells. And the stem cells reside in what's called a, a stem cell niche around the blood vessels. And the, the fat tissue, uh, which is a very biologically active tissue, has a lot of blood vessels, and a lot of these cells um, in this stem cell niche 
they're called mesenchymal stem cells or mesenchymal stromal cells. So these cells, okay, once they've been extracted in the lab, purified, identified, expanded, tested for potency, tested for... And, and expanded and means they multiply, multiply, multiply. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the technical word... Is one is, gets bigger. Yeah. So in the lab, you'd call it, you know, going through passages. Okay. Mm -hmm. So each time um, you plate them out into a new culture, that's called the passage. You normally get to about the fourth passage. Okay. Um, where you can get um, a, a big enough expansion in number of the right cells. And that's important so that you might have several million per ml of your solution. Mm -hmm. And then it comes back to you in your clinic about a month later, ready for injection into the joint, say. So yeah. that's, how, uh, that's how we use stem cells currently. Mm -hmm. Once the stem cells get into the joint or into the body, okay, they don't last very long. What we used to think, we used to think that, well, if we take some MSCs, the mesenchymal stem cells, from the dog, process them in the lab, get them back, inject them into the joint, then those are going to become new tissue. They're going to engraft and become new cartilage, new bone, or mm -hmm. new tissues of the kind that we want. That's actually not what happens. Right. The effects that they have are due to the paracrine effects that they have. So they release molecules, a whole plethora of molecules, okay, which do their bidding for them. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they, they kind of sacrifice themselves for us, okay? They might only live a day or three, okay? They fall upon their tiny little swords. Yeah, then. it's like a suicide mission, okay? They go in there. They we will help your joint. Exactly. They offload yeah. what they've got, and they are, um, well, a living medicine, yes, but they don't survive in the tissue, they don't engraft. So the main effects they have are they um, suppress inflammation, uh -huh. they modulate the immune system, mm -hmm. and they have trophic effects. And one of the main trophic effects they have is proangiogenesis. So they um, enhance or stimulate um, the growth of new blood vessels for healing the tissue. So, so, so do I need the stem cells? Could we just grow up a whole heap of stem cells from, say, a horse, a, a, a fat horse. I think a really fat horse. There's got lots of, lots of uh, fat cells. We grow those up, yep. mulch down all the stem cells, yep. and divide the aliquots of chemicals and, and inject them into dogs whenever we want. Is that, uh, is that well, what, what, we'll say, what you're saying is feasible, okay? Um, so maybe I should explain there are different... Um, I get a feeling this is going to be a sandwich here, Julian. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I asked I asked Russell this at uh, the lecture I was at yeah. uh, that he gave yeah. uh, a month ago, uh, which a I mean, fantastic lecture, absolutely fascinating lecture. And, and so uh, I, I was going to uh, plant, I think, in the audience. This I'll see if I can give you the same answer or a better answer. Well, okay. I've got a feeling I, should... a, I think there's a sandwich coming up here. So you've had the good bit. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm exactly. going to tell you why it's yeah. absolute bloody rubbish. Exactly. But keep thinking along those lines and everything's <laughs> yeah. good. It's a management yeah. speak, isn't it? It's a <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. I, know, I know what sandwich you're talking about, but I don't think we can say the word. No, we're not allowed to say shit on the show. No, no, you can't say shit on the show. No. No, no shit. No. no. Okay, I won't. Okay, no. So no, no shit sandwiches, right? So carry on. Okay. Carry on. Oh, so, that's so a great question. A bit, I mean, maybe, maybe I should explain that um, aut autologous um, adipose tissue is not the only place that you can get stem cells from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they can come from um, other tissues in the body. Okay. And they can come from other patients. So um, we would. Up until now, we've been talking about autologous transplants of cells from one patient back into the same patient. So we refer to that as autologous. But what if you took cells, say, from one dog and put them into a different dog? So because it's the same species, we call that an allogeneic transplant. So you can do that. Um, one of the things that we would worry about would be immune rejection. 
Right. But it turns yeah. out that the stem cells that we use are not particularly immunogenic. So it tends not to be a problem and rejection, it doesn't really happen. So it is possible you can do allogeneic injections. And the third kind is the xenogeneic. So you can even take cells from a different species. So you, your patient might be a dog, you might take cells from a different species, such as a horse, for example. Okay. Um, and there are different tissues that, that are um, MSC rich. So you might take them from bone marrow, you might take them from adipose cell, you might take them from umbilical cord. And since umbilical cord is uh, a throwaway um, in, you know, in, in after parturition, um, the umbilical cord um, is not used for anything. So that is accessible and a possible source of xenogeneic MSCs that can be taken to the lab, grown up, and then used as a xenogeneic injection. The problem there is you risk rejection. You do, um, although that doesn't, as I've said, they're not particularly immunogenic. And as mm. long as they've been selected for their immunophenotype, then it tends not to be a problem. Mm -hmm. it, it suddenly struck me that um, uh, you've been talking about a lot of MSCs, and that's what you're going for yourself, actually. But I, I, just sort of thinking out of the box there. Um, you use MSCs and you, you've got MSCs. I, said, well, I, I want to go further. I want to go further oh, on that oh, one. Oh, OK. OK. Oh, I I, right. Having okay. been diagnosed with arthritis at 16 years old. Right. Which prematurely ended my skiing career at 30. Goodness. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just intrigued. You know, can I do anything about this bone on bone on my knees? What kind of arthritis is it you've got? Is it osteoarthritis? Yeah. Yeah, well... Um, so surgery is possible, but you're way too young for surgery. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, um, regenerative medicine might help. Uh -huh. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I'm not qualified to say that because I'm talking about a human now. Um, and that's how it's. Oh, hang on, hang on. Right, let me rephrase the question. Yeah. My dog. <laughs> yeah. My yeah. dog was going to be a champion racer, but unfortunately, yeah. Uh, his career was cut short at about five years old when he was diagnosed with osteoarthritis. Yeah. Was he a Mexican hairless? <laughs> <laughs> you stay out of this, Julian. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, the long and the short of it is um, we are learning. Okay. Okay. So it's not we're not at the end of the road where we've got a finished product that we can say we know everything about arthritis. Mm -hmm. We know everything about stem cells. We know how to use them. We know which ones to use. We know when to use them. There are a lot of question marks, okay? And the more we learn, the better we're going to become at doing this. Mm -hmm. um, but the early results that I've seen anecdotally are very positive. Mm -hmm. So that is not science. That is anecdote, I realize. Mm -hmm. But from my experience of... Dealing with cases, it seems that most cases are very much improved. And it lasts quite a long time as well. So it might last a year or two years in a dog. Um, I've had cases where they've come off all medication, you know, because they've had stem cells. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's the be all and end all, all yeah. the finished product, but um, I'm definitely keen to do more and I'm definitely keen to learn more and refine what we're doing. Uh -huh. And as new developments happen, and there are new developments in the pipeline, as they come to fruition, you know, more and more will be known, more and more cases will be accumulated, and we'll probably get a better handle on what we're doing. Interesting. I have to say, I, I completely agree with, uh, with Russell here, and I, I, I would because I, I wouldn't have invited on the show otherwise, but uh, the... The, the handful of, of stem cell cases I've done in practice with, with, with you know, a, a minuscule amount of experience compared to, to Russell's, uh, the improvements I've seen have been quite tremendous. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think it really does hold tremendous promise for the future. We, for we, still, we still give a lot of these dogs uh, or cats or horses or whatever, um, nutraceuticals, so these uh, edible 
uh, chemicals that, that, that are supposed to help with, with, with joints. Uh, I'm thinking of the chondroitin and glucosamine, and we all have our green lip muscles, don't we? Is, is there any evidence really to suggest they work? Is there mm, a, a yes. particular type that's better than others? So the ones that you've mentioned, the short answer is not really. Mm -hmm. um, so the most recent paper that's come out, and I can't quote it to you, um, but I did read it, um, didn't find any benefit really of any of those. Mm -hmm. Okay. The one thing that is of use um, that we know is, is useful is omega-3. Right. So omega-3, I would put in a different category from those. One, because it seems to work. And two, because it's a different sort of, it's a different kind of supplement. So omega-3, and in in, if I need to explain, is a kind of fatty acid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What happens when you consume omega-3, and this is found in fish and in algae, well, fish get it from the algae, it's found in crustaceans and it's found in uh, wild fish. These um, omega-3s, when they get into your body or into the dog's body, um, they find their way into the cell membranes, mm -hmm. uh, the unit membranes that surround the cells. So they become a constituent of the cell membrane. Um, that's only important when the cell gets broken down. So when the cell gets too old and undergoes a process of um, apoptosis um, or autophagy, once it's broken down and the constituents are recycled, then the omega-3 goes into um, a, an enzyme pathway, the Cox pathway, and it's anti-inflammatory. Okay. Whereas if you didn't have that kind of fatty acid, the other kinds, they're pro-inflammatory. So it definitely is helpful for health, for sure, um, and especially anything that's got an inflammatory component, such as osteoarthritis. Interesting. The rest mm. of them, not so much. I don't think chondroitin sulfate and I don't think glucosamine do any harm. Mm -hmm. But the problem is there is such a wide range of uh, products available and many of them don't seem to live up to their label claims in terms of their ingredients or their strength. And the evidence that I've seen isn't compelling. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to spend your money, if you're a pet owner and your dog has osteoarthritis, then I would spend my money on omega-3 if I wanted a supplement rather than anything else. So you're saying that's, that's fish and it's lobster, it's shellfish. And bats, what do you say? Hey, you, you, no, I didn't say that. Yeah, no, no, you, you, the interesting thing though, um, yeah. I, I, I like bats, I always like bats, and I'm, I'm learning a little bit more about them as I go through life. But um, bats are quite remarkable creatures because bats rarely, if ever, get arthritis. And the reason seems to be that they have a, a higher apoptotic level so that their, their cell turnover is is higher than other mammals um, they have greater cell reparation systems and so uh, it's unlikely they'll get cancer it's unlikely they get um, uh, they get arthritis as I've just said and rats for their size live longer than most other mammals so uh, just look at a little pipistrelli bat about the same size as a, as a vole. Uh, voles live for 10 to 12 months and bats uh, the same size 30 to 40 years. So th th there's, there's a huge difference in the way that the cells turn over. Yeah. And it's recently been discovered they have a higher level of omega-3 oils in, uh, in their tissues. That's all very well, Julian, but mm -hmm. if yes, they are... Well completely regenerating most of their cellular function, is that the same bat at 30 years that you had at the first? It's like Rodney's guess, broom, isn't it? Was, it no, Trigger's, <laughs> trigger's broom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's 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 trigger's, trigger's broom. broom. Yeah, oh, exactly. Look after your broom, Rodney. Look after yeah. your broom. Yeah, tr Trigger's <laughs> bat. <laughs> Interesting. One, yeah. one thing I will say about the Omega-3 is you need to give in that of it. So, right. you you know, it's not just the odd sardine now and again. You need to give a decent dose. And as far as I'm aware, the minimum dose you should be looking for is 40 milligrams per kilogram of patient per day. 
you can go much higher. You can go up to 120 milligrams per kilogram. So you need a lot. Not yeah. even yeah. whales take that much. Yeah, it's, you need a lot. No, wow. I was in Wales a few oh. weeks back, and they, they take very little, mainly beer and chips. Yeah. Oh, sorry, different whales. Sorry. Different whales. Right. right, got you now. Got you now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but actually, it's, it's been well known for, for many years that the, the people who, who, who live uh, eating a, a fish-rich diet suffer from yeah. a, a different variety of problems, not, not, not yeah. necessarily fewer than a different variety. Yeah. So, interesting. That's the sort of thing that you could learn a lot from, isn't it? Uh, that, that sort of fact. Um, I wonder. I wonder if you could learn a lot from that in about sixty seconds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you want to give it a go? We're actually ready. Sixty second CPD. Yeah. On stem cells. Who's got oh, the stopwatch? Oh, on stem cells. Okay, that's fantastic stuff. All right. So. Great. All right, and Russell Chandler, this is the start of your sixty second CPD challenge. Sixty seconds on stem cells, starting now. All animals have stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are referred to as pluripotent because they can differentiate into any cell in the body. Stem cells are also present in the adult where they provide a ready source of cells for repair and renewal. These cells are typically multipotent. This means that they have differentiated some ways towards mature cell type. They can become cells of the embryonic layer to which they belong. So mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs, can differentiate into chondrocytes, osteoblasts, and adipocytes. In veterinary medicine, we use MSCs. MSCs can be derived from the patient in question, in which case they're referred to as autologous. Allogeneic MSCs come from a different individual of the same species, while xenogeneic MSCs originate from a different species altogether. The main indication for MSCs is in the management of orthopedic disease, so they are a kind of orthobiologic. The MSCs do not engraft in the tissue, um, and so they do not become new cartilage or bone. Instead, the MSCs are short-lived within the recipient tissue. The mechanism of actions of MSCs is paracrine. They contain a plethora of biologically active molecules, growth factors, and cytokines that do their bidding for them. The predominant effects are anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, trophic, and angiogenic. Yay! Well, you're Excellent. about two seconds, I think, into extra time there. That was that was great. That was, that was very, horrible. very good. That, I mean, that, that was, a, that was a, a textbook chapter in 60 seconds. That, that was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, Thank you. That's all you need to know, really. Do you know so, that? So, so, yeah. so much everything. for our research, because Julian and I spent 20 minutes discussing and researching most of the terms and the terminology that you've just gone through in 60 <laughs> seconds. But the sensible thing for us in future, Julian, I think, is let's just get the guest on, get into the 60-second CPD first. Yes, then we'll have done all of the research that we then discuss with our guest later on. Well, in some sort of reflection. Get the guest to do the work. That's that's probably the key, isn't it, really? I think so. It is, actually. It's yeah. the way forward, definitely. And we'll, you, you're in touch with our producers anyway, I think, Russell. They've, they've sent you various bits of information. So you feel free to take over veterinary ramblings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're off. Bye. <laughs> we're off. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> but now you you have your own podcast, though, don't you, Russell? That's true. That's true. So um, I'm lucky enough to be involved in the Veterinary Osteoarthritis Alliance, or the VOA for short, um, which is a non-profit that has a mission to improve the way that osteoarthritis management is done in mm -hmm. mainly dogs, but also cats and other veterinary species. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, like I say, I'm lucky enough to be a director in this organization. And one of my duties or one of my um, one, one of the things that I do within the BOA is I do have my own podcast. OK, mm -hmm. so I'm well, I say my, my own podcast. It's the BOA podcast, but I'm the current, current podcast host. Right. So so how can our listeners uh, on, on the nights off from listening to our podcast, right. of course, exactly how, right. how can they listen to yours? Right. Do they just oh. type in? It was it was the case that we only allowed our podcast to be um, for members only, but now we're just beginning to release our back catalogue, and the most recent episode you'll find on Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. So if you were to search under Veterinary Osteoarthritis Alliance podcast, you'll find it. Maybe Great. we can put a link somewhere if you want to. That's we can do that in the other website. I think. Yeah, so... Um, it's great because um, just like you, I get some uh, fascinating and very clever guests on and I get to pick their brains. Um, they tell me 
and the listeners what they know. Mm -hmm. A little bit of prompting from me, but it's fantastic because uh, we can distill down a huge amount of knowledge into maybe just half an hour or an hour. And I find that a wonderful way of doing my own CPD, mm. plus distributing knowledge. I think distributing uh, knowledge, especially sort of scientific and veterinary knowledge, to a wider audience is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Which is why yep. what, you're, what you guys are doing is, is you know, it's a fantastic thing. Well, thank you very much. We we enjoy doing it. We love it. And it's, it's wonderful having uh, different guests on each week getting to know a little bit about them and getting a little bit more knowledge, just, just little facts and figures and, and uh, tidbits here and there. So yeah. it's, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that it's a, a tremendous profession because we are uh, pluripotent within our profession. And I think, um, I think we've just demonstrated that tonight, that actually yeah. there, there are so many different facets and so many different directions you can go off uh, in, in the course of what, an hour here. Mm. Uh, in the course of your veterinary lifetime, you can go off in, in many many different ones and, and i think we've, we've probably hardly touched what uh, what what directions you've gone off in, in, in your career tonight absolutely tell me russell with your with your podcast do you um you, you say that you get your cpd in there so you're presumably claiming that with your production of the podcast or your your you're giving the podcast that uh, that's going to classify for your six 16 hours or 20 hours of CPD? Yeah, well, um, yes. Okay. Because of the work involved and right. the research yeah. involved. So, yes. Okay. So, do you give certificates out? Um, we haven't yet. Oh. Oh, hold on. We, we do. We do. We, we do. So, I've noticed. We, yeah, we do. So, we, we, expect, yeah. we expect all of our listeners, if they need CPD, to troll along and, and sort of yeah. photocopy or download the copy of the current CPD certificate and present that to the RCVS as proof of yeah. CPD. Proof yeah. of, of, of a whole minute of CPD. So here we go. We've got a, a certificate of multipotency. Oh, go on then. Let's go. have a look. And it says, it says, this certifies that Steve Austin was a man barely alive. But re we rebuilt his dog for less than $6 million. So, and... And there, there we go. There was a knock to the six million dollar man there. Uh, there. Now, there's always a, a series of photos in here. So here's a picture of me doing some improbable climbing move, which is almost certainly why I have mild knee arthritis now. I was thinking that would be a good position to adopt to get the adipose tissue. Yeah, that that would be just reach on. That's really legal. Out. That photograph. It, it is it's rather illegal now, yeah. So anyone who's listening to this is going to want to go onto the website now. Maybe, yeah, um, maybe maybe some so pixels. Now, now the next yes. is going to be. I mean, this is a uh, double negative, really. This next one is it's is a real no no because here is mussels, moon marinier that I ate only because of the supposed uh, uh, benefits I get from from the. Uh, green dip muscle extract uh, but i'm eating them in uh, an edible bowl made from bread so there we go we've got carbohydrates and muscles both of which are completely useless so i'm going to scrap that <laughs> bats however there's, you go, there's a load of bats down there uh, we know they're good for us uh how many do you have to eat though well you don't want to eat too many because of covid but there we go a few just a few uh now we all like to think of ourselves here as a as a nice, well tuned sports car, don't we? There we go. There's a couple of Ferraris, and that's that's how I see myself. Although with my age uh, rapidly increasing, uh, I, I find myself more often than not looking like a, a clapped old old lost in Metro like, like this one here. Uh, but maybe stem cells will be the answer to that. Maybe platelet rich plasma will be the answer to that. Maybe something new like here we go. There's a picture of a fungus i'm a great mycologist i love mycology uh, and that fungus was a ganoderma species and we we're already using those for uh, for chemotherapy uh, but both as a chemotherapeutic agent and also to protect cells uh, against the ravages of chemotherapy maybe we can find a, a fungus that'll help us with arthritis later on in life who knows so, who knows who knows but all in all that's the certificate to say thank you very very much russell for for giving us such an excellent uh cpd evening really very, very thoroughly enjoyed enjoy. so. but i've i've got another question though for russell mm -hmm. as, as we know 
this CPD, we, we receive the CPD, we certify yes. it, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we have to reflect on our CPD. We do. Not enough just to give the CPD, we've got to reflect. But we have to reflect on it. Now, back in, back in the day, the, the episode I think that you saw, we had a very different way of dealing with reflection, except the feedback that we got was that our listeners, who make up the majority of our audience, were bemused by this one-minute silence in the <laughs> middle of the show, which was our reflection. So what we've done now is we, we've we're sitting it. silently reflecting. Yeah, we said, hmm. But we don't. What we now say is perhaps our guests would be kind enough to ask us a reflection question. There's something to put out to the to the audience, to, to both of them. Just to get them to were. think. Hmm. So, um, as you may know, I'm quite big on gratitude. I, okay. love my, I love my gratitude. I'm very grateful for everything in my professional life and in my personal life. Mm -hmm. I love the profession. I love my career. I would do it again. Mm -hmm. um, so what I would, uh, the difference I find with a lot of my colleagues that I speak to is they seem not to have the same kind of positivity that we three have. Mm -hmm. okay. So what I would uh, challenge people to think about is, one, to think about why they're grateful that they're working in our profession, mm -hmm. have this wonderful career, have this wonderful opportunity, have great colleagues, have so many different, you know, a range of diverse opportunities that you have as a vet or as a veterinary nurse, mm -hmm. as uh, working in a veterinary practice. I'd like them to think about all the things that they're grateful for, about their lives and about their career and about their profession, okay? Maybe take a moment maybe write them down, count their blessings, okay? Mm. And then do that before they go to bed. And when they wake up in the morning, probably things will seem just that little bit rosier, just that little bit more positive. So that's what I would like people to think about why we're grateful, how lucky we are, and uh, try to put that into their mind and into their subconscious. That's a great suggestion, a great reflection. Because we, we are we are negative, aren't we? As, yeah. as a profession, we, we are negative. We, we go home every day thinking, oh, that, that Mrs. Smith, you know, she, she's right. I did a bad job on her dog. I, I, it was awful. You know, she had to go and be rightly so. Rightly so, I'm, I'm crap. We don't think of the 30 other people who yeah. maybe silently said thanks. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's it's that quest for perfection, isn't it? it it's mm. it's the desire to do the right thing every time, and that quest for perfection, and yes. as a caring profession, to to help, to save, and and you can't always, and it's always that one little one little seed of of doubt, isn't it? Or that one little negative that we tend yeah. to focus on. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's human nature. I, yeah, I, I take I take your suggestion perhaps a little bit further because you said you're big on gratitude and, and uh, being grateful and things. I I would I would also say, and I'm, I'm sure uh, that, that I'm just echoing what 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 you would have said if we'd given you longer reign. Just say thank you to someone you've worked with. Mm. Just 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 thank you. Thanks very much. What did I do? Well, I don't know actually, but or or I do know. You, know, you you did this, you did X, Y, Z, or I don't know. I've enjoyed the day, and part of that has been because of you. So thank you very much. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Hmm. Can I ask? Uh, can I ask you, Russell? Because it's it's a very positive, it's a very positive reflection and a very positive question. Was there anything that tr is that has that been a creeping feeling with you, or was yeah. there something that sort of has triggered or or provoked that 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 reflective view? Yeah, I think when I was a younger person, a younger vet, mm -hmm. I did have quite a negative streak. Right. 
and it's something that I have over the decades learned to control and adapt mm-hmm. and have my own positive outlook. And by mm-hmm. doing that, you know, they say that if you smile, the world smiles with you, mm-hmm. you know, just by, you know, looking at the looking at the world and maybe being a bit more introspective, looking inside and saying, what can I do? Not the world is against me. I've got mm-hmm. this problem, that problem. It's all, everything's ganging up on me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the victim mm-hmm. of everything that's happening. Yep. Rather than do that, what I would prefer to do, I don't always manage to do it, but what I prefer to do is look inside and say, well, I can make things a lot worse with a bad attitude because you can always make things worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what can I change about the way that I'm thinking? Okay. Or the way that I'm speaking Mm -hmm. or the way that I'm acting to move things to a slightly better place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And especially the words that you use. Okay. So when I go into work and people say, how are you? And if I say, how are you to my colleagues? They say, oh, not too bad. Okay. The emphasis is on the bad. Okay. They say, say, Russell, how are you? I say, I'm fantastic. Marvellous. You know, and just by repeating those words, those positive words every day, it, it makes a difference. So positive thoughts, positive words positive feelings um hmm. and it's it was made a massive difference to me it's night and day compared to how i was when i was younger and how relatively unhappy i was and how happy and content i am now it's really you know it's made a massive difference to me because so often we feel uh and, and we see it our colleagues feel that the world owed me this and it hasn't delivered yes, yes. And, and that's you're always going to be let down because the, the world doesn't care. The world doesn't give a damn. <laughs> Precisely. So yeah, you're going to be able to give a damn at us yeah. and then hopefully Precisely. be our colleagues and friends. But once I realised that it was on me, hmm. it's, not, it's up to me. I can make things better. It's not up to yeah. anything else. It's not up to circumstances. But when I talk to my younger colleagues, it's amazing, you know, the, the things that they say just makes me see that they are in a way, you know, they're not the captain of their own ship. You know, they're not they're not determining the direction of their life. Yeah. They're just kind of seeing what happens, you know. Mm. You know, mm. rather than saying, well, I'm going to make that happen. This is my destination. Okay, I'm going to aim for that. Okay, because if you do that and you write it down and you make a plan, you can get there. Yes, yes. But you've got to be committed. You've got, you've, to you've, got to ha- you've got to have a map. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And you've got to believe it. Yes. I yeah. I think I think that is absolutely wonderful, Russell. And that that really, on that philosophical note, but that very positive philosophical note, I'm going to do the I'm, I'm rather, rather frustrating thing of saying, thank you very much indeed, Russell Chandler, for, for sharing all of this with you. And to any of our listeners, if you want to hear more from Russell, check out the podcast, the VOA podcast, or some of the other stuff that Russell's getting involved in. Don't forget to click like and subscribe because it really does help us. So please subscribe and don't forget to tune in to your next episode of Veterinary Ramblings. Russell Chandler, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. I'll raise my glass to you. May your dog go with you. May your dog go with you. Cheers. Absolutely. Thank you. And cut. Yay! Hey. For another episode. Good. So now we can say shit. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. That's brilliant. Brilliant. Oh yeah, I love it. I mean, you guys are such professionals. That's brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. It's effortless. For you guys, it's effortless. You, you can t- you can tell he hasn't listened to any other episodes yeah, other than really, other it's than it's <laughs> you, know, I don't, no, you, you actually made it very easy for us, Russell. Thank mm. you. Really? Oh, excellent. <laughs>